Well, thanks, Wendy and Karen, for having me back on. Um, it's been a long haul with this particular book. I started writing this book probably about six years ago, um, just before I wrote the veterans book, and always connected for veterans. Um, and, and the veterans book kind of took a took a first place all of a sudden because there was a lot a lot of stuff going on in Afghanistan, and I thought it needed to be written because there was a lot of suicides going on with a lot of the uh, soldiers coming home. So I put this particular project on the back burner and uh, working on it a little bit here and there over the years. And then this year, all of a sudden, I said, listen, I got to get this thing done. And just kind of went full throttle on it and finally got completed. Um, it, it, it took a long time, but I think that was part of the process because during that time, I got to... Uh, gain more knowledge and information, uh, not only through my research and channeling and talking to the other side, but also by doing readings for uh, uh, people that had lost children. And some of the children came through and added to some of this knowledge, which I thought was really, really great because it comes from a different perspective. And I think that's really important when we do this type of work, that we have information coming from different angles and from different places so that we can... Um, you know, we can we can all look at different sources and, and see what's what, where the common common uh, avenues are, and I think that's really important in any type of work like this that we do. So I set up this book, Always Connected, for those who have lost children, and I set it up very similar to the veterans book. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring through information um, that could help some of the people that have lost children on on our side. And I thought it was important to bring through insights from the children on the other side, like I had brought through uh, some veterans for the veterans book, so we could hear it right from them. Um, I also thought it was important to continue um, uh, adding different signed stories like I had done in my other books, because it's a validation that our loved ones continue to be with us after they pass the, from the earth plane. And I think it's, it's a really good balance to have um, when we discuss some of these complex um, ideas and information because it really can get overwhelming to a certain point. So I had asked my guides when the information came through this time, like in the veterans book, to try to keep it as simple as possible so that many different people at different stages of the development could understand the information. The last thing I wanted was someone to read some information or a chapter and it just goes right over their head. So that's not going to do them any good. So I needed to keep it, you know, keep it so that I understood it. If I can understand it, then you guys can understand it. So that's, that's kind of the concept behind the book. I also wanted to make sure that I included uh, various topics and because when a child passes, there's so many other things that are going on in that situation <clears throat> that each parent or someone that has lost a child, they've done it many different ways. So people have questions, various questions on uh, uh, different methods of passing and things like that. So I wanted to touch base on a lot of different ones. Um, and, and that's why the book's almost 300 pages. On the other hand, I also wanted to keep a lot of it um, on the shorter form, just kind of give an outline about certain topics, because some of these topics you could write a whole book on, you know, on addiction, depression, uh, violence, and things like that. You can you could write two or three books on that. So I didn't want to end up writing for the next 10 years and have an 800-pound book. So I decided to keep it relatively relatively slim on each subject. So what I wanted to do is I just want to read some parts of the book and then, and then I'm going to comment on it. And then when we do the uh, question and answer, um, uh, people have a little bit more background on it. Um, one of the, at the very beginning of the book, I go over who actually a child is. And I think we have a big misconception about um, who a child actually is. And I'll just read a couple of comments here. Um, we don't allow the real essence of a child to be recognized, that the child is actually a fully independent spiritual being. And then it goes on and explains that our perspective of a child is, is both 
limited and um, through our perspective of our time here on the earth plane. So everything is by, you know, we have dates, we have born, they die, uh, you know, different seasons. We, we go by the, that regulation of time and, and it doesn't work that way. There is no, it, to us there's a birth and a passing a death, but in, in reality, it's all one continuous life. So we might think that a little baby that's born is like this, this little essence that's, you know, it totally has no power and, and, and doesn't know anything about the world. And to a certain degree, that's true. But on a deeper level, they come with a lot of tools, a lot of insights, a lot of um, characteristics and, and things that are built into them that will come out later on in their life, depending on, on their, their life experiences. But the essence of who they are is going to be the same when they arrive as when they leave, just like Oz will be. We will have more experiences, we'll have more interactions, we'll have growth opportunities, but the essence of who we are will basically stay the same. So we have to remember that a child is actually here for their particular purpose, and we are here to interact with that child, and vice versa. That child will create such uh, situations for us for our learning abilities. And one of these things is crossing over before it's time, or we call it before it's time. But many times children will pass over at the right time after fulfilling many of their opportunities and goals that they had originally come to, um, to create and to uh, be involved with. So I think it's important that we realize that there's no time, it's more about the quality of, of living and interaction. There's an uh, example in the book about a, like a five or six year old girl learning how to ride a bike and an 80 year old man learning to, how to walk with a walker after hip surgery and how so different it seems to us of what they can offer us. And basically they're exactly the same in that situation. They're both teaching that they need someone to help them, assist them with something new and um, someone giving their time and compassion and dealing with them. So you have possibly an 80 year swing and the same type of goal and opportunity is created. So that way we can look at it as the quality of the opportunity and the outcome as opposed to getting stuck in that rut of, of time. Okay, so I think that's really important. And I think once people understand that perspective, it opens up a little bit more on some other things, which, which is really important. One of the reasons why they left, I'm going to read right here. This comes from the chapter why they left. Sometimes when children pass over at a young age, they have completed many of the tasks they came to be part of. Some will excel as the main character in the scene, while others will play backup roles that are important to other individuals as they are to themselves. As opportunities play out, different results come into play. Some of these results will cause the passing of individuals before they have had time to complete other opportunities that they have been arranged, but this does not hurt their spiritual development. There are also different exits that they can take. Uh, the means that soul may take the opportunity to cross back over before they have completed other opportunities. They are allowed to come back because they have fulfilled the majority of the things that they have set out to accomplish. When a child leaves sooner than everyone expected, they are actually instigating the growth potential of many of those left behind. So not only have they accomplished many of their goals, but in leaving, they also create the opportunity for major growth for those left behind. This unselfish act is created through ultimate, the ultimate love between the individuals left behind and the spirit who has crossed over. It can be difficult to accept this concept, but on a spiritual growth, it is immensely important. Children often cross due to circumstances outside their control. They may have interacted with other individuals or groups that caused the passing. Individual free will can create a complex structure of interactions. 
when the soul sees an opportunity for growth and interaction, they may decide at that point in their life to take advantage of that opportunity. However, this opportunity can also create an unbalanced situation for them and others at the same time. An example of this may be deciding to go out with friends to a particular location at a particular time and being involved in a fatal automobile accident. This is not to say that every fatal auto accident is caused by free will or someone taking the opportunity to join possible different outcomes. Some accidents are early exits, others are pre-planned, and still others are caused by free will. In some instances, it's a combination of all three. So it can get really complex um, when a child passes because, excuse me, because there's a lot of other things going on. And that's one of the big things I want people to understand is we always talk about the bigger picture. There really is a bigger picture. And, and, and dealing with some of these children, I have a little bit of glimpse of it. And, and people that will read the book will have a little bit more insight into that bigger picture. First of all, we're not allowed to know everything. We're not allowed to know a lot of things. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get pieces here and there to try to give us um, better insight and perspective on the whole process of, in this particular situation, uh, a child that we thought passed before their time. They have the ability to interact with not only their, their individual family members, but actually in other groups. Um, we come here in, in souls of groups, group souls, and some will come before we're born and some will come after we're born, and we will interact with these groups of souls throughout our life. At times, the soul will also want to interact with other soul groups that it had not planned on interacting before it came, and that's done through free will. So someone might decide, hey, I want to be an adventure. I want to check this out. I want to do this. What happens is they, they will get involved in another soul groups, um, activities that are being, that have been planned out for particular reasons with that particular soul group. So I don't want to get too complex on that, but basically I, there's an example I put in the book. It's, it's like the old, when we were in grammar school, the three circles that interlocked, you know, so you can have, I think they actually did color circles. And um, so basically, children and all of us to that extent, we can interact with different groups of people and that would create different outcomes for um, possible passing. I just want to back up a little bit and I want to go through a little bit about the uh, soul plans, which are opportunities that we pre-plan when we come here and some uh, possible achievements. And then we have the life plan. A life plan is where we, um, we draw up before we come here of how we want those opportunities to be available to us. And the life plan is a little bit more fluid. There's a lot more fluid than the soul plan. And the life plan can be changed once you're here through free will. And there's an example in the book that one of the soul purposes was to save someone um, from drowning and that, that was one of their goals to experience that <clears throat> for whatever reason um, and the person the life plan was that this person was going to be born in Great Britain and they were going to join uh, they were going to be a sailor in their 20s which would give them the opportunity to help save someone from drowning now the person's born the born born in Britain and they get to the age of like 22 or something, and they decide, hey, I want to move to California. So they move to California and they become a surfer. The life plan has been changed because of free will, but the opportunity to um, achieve that soul plan is still very much available because this individual is going to be working on the water and the, and the opportunity will be there for them. So that's a little bit kind of like about the soul plans and the life plans and free will that they can kind of interact with each other. There are exit plans, exit points I mean. With an exit point, uh, we have various amount. Um, it's debatable, it's more like maybe around three, four, some people say around that much. And it seems to be that, it'd be a little bit more complex if there were more than that. 
And these are opportunities for us to leave the earth plane um, before necessarily what we would think, you know, here that would be our time. And they can be taken for various reasons. One being we've accomplished most of the things that we wanted to accomplish while we were here. And another one being that us staying here may create more pain and suffering that, than that which is necessary. And by that means certain things can play out where loved ones around us may have to go through certain lessons and learnings that they don't necessarily need. And therefore, we, we create that type of pain and suffering. Um, so the person can decide on a soul level to take that exit. So that can happen any time during their life. Um, interacting with other groups, as I had mentioned before, someone might decide to join another group um, in, in different life's activities they're playing out. And at that point, if, if someone on that group is doing an exit, um, someone, that person that joined the group might decide, hey, I've got most of my things done. I think I want to take an exit with these guys too. So you might see that in the type of fatal car accident where um, uh, two people go, two people pass. Um, I've also seen that with uh, parents that have lost more than one child, which I was pretty surprised, um, that they can be in cahoots and decide that one's going to follow the other or they, they might possibly go at the same time. So um, that's kind of an interesting aspect. Um, I'm just going to go through a few more topics and then we're going to ask some questions because I think I can get more specific with the, the questions. I wanted to cover the topic of guilt, which was huge because it holds us, it holds us back in our healing process. And many times the guilt is uh, self-judgment um, that becomes almost like in a cycle and we just totally replay it over and over and over and we are actually punish, punishing ourselves for things that we do not know. Certain larger picture things that are going on that we can blame ourselves. So they wanted to definitely talk about that. Could I have done something differently is, is one of the chapters. Um, I'm gonna say, there are many aspects to a crossing and they depend on each individual. Some may have pre-planned their crossing. Some may have taken advantage of an early exit. Others will pass due to judgment of free will. What all these have in common is that the individual who crosses over is in charge to a certain degree. And I think that's really, really important because when it comes to major decisions, actions such as crossing back over to the spirit plane, your influence as a parent or guardian is not as important as you think. You do not have control over the child's transition. And I just kind of jumped a little bit there, but that's a huge, huge, huge thing. And I think tied that in with guilt. I think it, it really needs to be understood. I was shown and in, in, through some of the children's insights that they run the show. They run the show. You may think that you were part of the uh, cause of the transition. You're not. They decided. You don't know if it was pre-planned or if it was part of uh, an early exit or, like I said in the book, if it was a free will thing. But even if you were participating in an act that caused the passing of a child or your child, you didn't have control of that. And I know that's hard to understand, especially if you're talking about like if you, you're, you're drinking and driving and, and, and you caused the, the death of a, your child or someone else or something. There's more to play at it. It's very fascinating. Um, in some situations, if that child did not pass at that time, they would have passed shortly after that for something that's similar, okay? Um, I had talked to a lady who's, um, who had uh, son had passed um, in a car accident, and um, there were two other children that were also passed in that car accident. And it turns out the friend that drove the, drove the children, was taking them out for the day, um, was driving under the influence. So she had a lot of guilt for letting the children go with this particular man. And of course, this man was horribly uh, 
uh, burden with the with the outcome of that. But it, uh, it I was explained to me just before that, and I explained to her that in this particular situation, he would have passed uh, soon after that particular event, and uh, it, it came to me that I said, you know, he could have passed a couple of days later in a drowning if it was his time through an exit point and stuff like that. And she said to me, it's interesting, Joe, because I didn't mention to you that the man picked up my, my child and his two friends. They were on the way to the river to go, to go uh, rafting. So I don't know if that was a coincidence or if that's part of what Spur kind of wanted me to, um, to mention to her. So the guilt that she had, um, she began to understand that there was more at play and that these individuals can and do interact with all of us for various different reasons. Um, some of the children's insight into this is really interesting. There was one with a car accident and, and, and the, the teenagers in it, and they talk about how um, the two of them had pre-planned it and another one had uh, joined that group and decided to, uh, to also take an early exit. So there's a lot of dynamics going on, um, and I think as adults we have to realize that these children have their own agenda, even though we think we are the wiser, um, but on, on a level, a different level, we're all kind of like on the same level, on, on a soul level. So we have to give them some slack because it's not necessarily um, through ignorance, but it's 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 a a lot of times it's a well played out orchestrated event and an event of opportunities. So things are not always pre planned, but sometimes the opportunities come up where um, things play out. An interesting story that just popped in my head was a child who had planned to be adopted, and she was born. And the father was in on it, but the mother wasn't. And the whole lesson was um, to see if the mother would accept this child as her adopted will. And it, play, it played out that the, the wife, uh, I'm sorry, the, the mother, the stepmother, decided to uh, marry this man and to take on uh, and to adopt the daughter and raise her like it was her own biological child. And so through free will, she gave willingly her love and her, um, and her life to this child, giving up other opportunities for advancement in career or, or through creative op opportunities and things like that. But by doing so, she, she accumulated so much, um, so much, soul elevation to the fact that she gave up so much of her life to to take on this the burden of raising a child that wasn't her and i thought that was a really great example about how they can really kind of pre-plan certain things out and um so okay on, on suicide um it just i'm going to jump around a little bit on this chapter but it's uh Suicide is a complex event focusing on one individual but having repercussions beyond the individual's perspective. You see, when a person decides to take their own life, it jeopardizes events not only in their life to come, but also people who interact and are associated with the victim. Many times, the person who takes his own life does not fully understand what is happening to them and the purpose of their life. They are confused as to the nature of their being and why it is necessary, excuse me, to live out their path. A lot of times, at, I'm gonna jump to the depression, which is part of it. At certain times, the human body will experience illness in various forms. Some of these may be pre-programmed into the life plan before birth to help create opportunities for growth by the individual and others. Depression and other forms of mental illness could fall under this category. And, it, and when I say could, it could, not that it has to. 
Illness caused by trauma and other situational events can occur during one's life and are not necessarily pre-planned. However, at times, both of these types of afflictions may cause too much of a disruption of the mind-soul connection and cause isolation in the human experience. Not knowing how to deal with this overwhelming challenge, the human individual takes over the entire process of decision-making. The insights that the soul has will become blocked, and the tools the soul has brought to the earth plane are not able to be used. At times, the tools themselves have not been integrated into the soul fully before being born. The human environment and conditions are then the only source of reason and decision making. Under these circumstances, the individual is not allowed to see the bigger picture because they have shut, them off, shut themselves off from their soul connection. It's like losing radio contact with an individual and then that individual having to make decisions without knowing all the facts. So when we come here, we come here with a lot of uh, tools to help us. And somewhere up the top of my head, the ability to laugh, to, to reduce stress. Uh, insights is very, very strong. When we have a feeling about something, it, it's used from a child, knowing if there's, you know, uh, you know, someone's, you know, hateful or loving or something basic like that, all the way to the point where um, we use it all through adulthood. When an individual is in a particular state of mind, in this particular state of mind, their decision-making abilities are corrupted. Their free will choices cannot tap into insights they may need to function correctly, so they become unregulated and indiscriminate. This is what may lead to them taking their own lives. Um, this particular situation has not been set up before they arrive, but it can be used to learn certain important experiences, such as self-love, compassion for others, and how to bring awareness to this problem when individuals feel lost and uncontact, un, unconnected. The individual soul that returns to the spirit realm after committing suicide is greeted with love and compassion. And we, and we know that. And we know that they are, um, they are taught um, how to deal with their feelings when they get to the other side. They've also, um, they begin to learn self-love for having taken their own life and will realize that they did not have the tools to continue to live on the earth plane. A young man named Kevin, who passed by suicide, explained this to his mother during a reading, stating, Mom, I didn't know how to handle things. I left my toolbox in the truck. And Kevin claims, uh, comes through very, very clear. And I thought that was a great, great quote he, he had told me, and I wanted to put it in the book, definitely because it really kind of lays it out where some people that commit suicide, they just don't have some of the tools they need to deal with life on this side. Um, some people come here and they want to, they come uh, with pre-planned addictions so that they can um, teach others about them. Um, sometimes they come with depression to teach others about them. Um, but sometimes those um, afflictions they come with can be overwhelming and they can corrupt the body, mind, spirit connection. And when this happens, it can lead to um, being shut down from your, your soul connection and, and uh, possibly suicide. But a lot of times people, when they come here and they say, I want to come with an addiction, a lot of times you'll see those people conquer that addiction and go on to be counselors or to help other people that have had this particular problem. That might have been their goal when they when they decided to come here um, for this particular life event, life experience. Uh, but like I said, some of them can get caught up in the addiction and the chemical imbalance that it can create, and this can um, cause things to go kind of haywire. Where even though they know that they have this addiction, but the chemical dependency can throw things out of where their attention. And you can only focus on the addiction itself and, um, and nothing else. And, and it becomes a spiral downward. And, and when that happens, they lose some of the perspective. They lose a lot of this perspective um, that the rest of us might have who are not in that situation. And so it's really important to, for people to understand the, the perspective that an in individual has before taking their own life. Um, so it, it is complex, there are other things involved. So, but um, 
so there's no easy answer there, but there are other things involved and they understand it when they cross over and they learn a lot of things. Some of the stuff is reintegrated in them and when they're reborn, um, they'll have a stronger uh, ability to, um, to survive in our environment. And so, um, so that's something that's very positive. They also help people here that are going through um, stressful, hopeless situations that they think here. Um, and some of the children on the other side will help them from their side um, to the children here on our side, even some adults here. So um, they always want us to reach out and ask for help and they will intervene to a certain degree as much as possible. So, so that's a little bit on the, uh, the suicide and the um, depression. I have, yep. a, I have a problem with them choosing a horrible way to go. And if that is the case, are they aware of the hurt that that exit leaves for the moms, dad, siblings? Are they, and if you are aware of that as a soul, I can't understand why one would choose that route, just be it suicide or addiction or horrible car accident. And this is more for a child, I guess, leaving when, when, you know, and the parents assume they're going to live a full life and have grandbabies someday and all. I'm just have to struggle with the soul planning. Well, and I just want to touch the last thing that you mentioned about grand, grandchildren and stuff like that. When it's your time to pass over, you will have the opportunity to live every moment of your life with your child from whatever state, from whatever point they left, all the way through uh, the senior years. So people that miss the milestones, such as graduations, babies, grandbabies, um, all those things will have that opportunity to relive that timeline with them when they go over. If someone commits suicide to try to follow their child because for various reasons, for you know, they want that physical uh, closeness to be with them, they will not have that opportunity to live those um, those moments again because they would have corrupted the system to the point where the, the person that crosses over to, to follow the child will have to go through so much um, self-healing and, um, and just go through a whole bunch of learning processes for some of the, um, the suffering they left behind, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of times parents think if they commit suicide, um, it, they'll see their child again in that circumstance like they see it now, and it doesn't work that way because what will happen at that circumstance is they'll cross over, and the child that they meet could be a middle-aged person. It could be a highly advanced soul because we know some children that come here are highly advanced souls. I mean, we, some people we call old souls. Oh, she's an old soul, and she's only like 12. Some of them are old souls, and they have completed a lot of stuff. And, and, and really, they're, they're the adult, and we're the kids. So, you know, so, so if you cross over before your time, because of your own decision, um, you will find that reality. So that those moments that you wanted to share with your young daughter or child or son uh, will be there, because you'll be greeted by, you'll be gre greeted by the, soul, uh, the soul of the child, but it won't be the same type of love. It's a stronger, greater, finer vibrational love than the physical love that we have here. So what happens is the person that cross, crosses over in that manner, they get very confused. They get confused and um, it takes a lot of healing um, for them to be able to understand what has happened in that particular thing. It's amazing, when you, especially when you talk to some of the kids about the way they cross. To them, it's, an, it's just another way to die. But to you and me, it's like, why would you pick that particular, why do you want to fall off a mountain? You know, why, you know, why can't you just die in your sleep? But to them on the other side, it's like, no, I, I had the opportunity to take this exit point in this particular, let's say, car accident, and um, which in that particular incident, the, the child would have been pulled out um, uh, immediately just before the, the impact. Um, and, and they would be able to have control of their own exit, okay? And I think that's really important. That's what I was saying earlier is 
they have control, they decide, and, and they choose when and how. Now, I'm with you. I'm still trying to figure out, but why would you choose that way? Why wouldn't you choose this way? But they keep coming back. It's like, what's the difference? What's the difference? It's like I decided to be take an adventure and, you know, ride the trains to the United States and stuff like that. You know, the fact that I was hit by a train, that's part of the deal. It's part of the free will. And so they were willing to take that risk. Um, they do know the suffering that we go through when, when they leave us. And that's one of the biggest things they come through with their insights. And that's why they send the science stories because they want you to realize they're still here. They're still part of your life. They're, you're still considered part of their family. And you will be when you cross over. So it's not like out of sight, out of mind. And, and, and not to just be able to think about them. They really are there. They are, they are really there. And that's why they, you know, they push the signs and stuff. They interact in your life and they will, um, they'll be with you until it's your time to, to, to cross over. So it's another thing about perspective. It's all about, um, you know, there's no beginning or end. It's just a continuation. Um, Gloria? Yes, Joe. Um, hey. If a child uh, dies uh, at any age of depression or addiction, is any of that carried over to the spirit world or are they immediately healed uh, upon crossing? When they get to the other side, they can see the perspective exactly of what happened and why it played out. So they don't, they don't carry that burden because they realize, like in Kevin's situation, he had come through and said, you know, I, I left my toolbox in the truck. I didn't have the tools to be able to deal in this life. And then when he got to the other side, he realized that it wasn't, he didn't have the answers that he was looking for. And that's what caused his suicide. So he saw why it happened. And so he's not judging himself. He's just realizing it played out that way because that's the only way it could have played out in that situation. Um, from from what I had to deal with, so no, they're not. They do not carry that on the other side. Um, they're greeted with love and compassion. Um, they are, are taught. They have healers sit that teach them and show them the perspective, help them with the uh, perspective of of why they did it at that particular time. And once they look over the situation, it's like, oh, I understand that. And I, I saw a lot of that in the veterans book when people are. Um, you know, a, a lot of veterans were committing suicide because they were afraid that, you know, they killed someone. And, and then the vets on the other side would say, well, that's, that's the environment you were in. And so when they get to the other side, they realize, you know, that was the choice. I had a limited amount of choices for, for what I could do from the information I had. And that's why I like to put about the, uh, the example about having radio contact. You lose radio contact, you don't have any other anyone to help or lead you or a mentor you or guide you. So what happens is the physiological condition of the human body, our brain takes over. And the last thing you want is the brain taking over because it's going to run it like a machine and it's going to try to figure out the Rubik's cube and it's not going to be able to do it. And it's just going to burn itself out. But when you have the ability to use your brain and your insights and your experiences and all these other things, then you have problem solving techniques and you can possibly uh, reach out for help if it's addiction or if it's another problem you have. Um, but once you, those things close off, which we see in addiction because it can really shut down parts of you because all of a sudden you're taking on the burden that uh, self judgment, you're isolated, you're trying to hide it a lot of times um, and, and it just kind of closes in on yourself. And, and when that happens, you shut off those other tools that we naturally have. But when they get to the other side, they see that. They see that. They, they see that they were trying to build a building, you know, with a, with a screwdriver, you know, and a saw, and that's it. Hi, Joe. Thanks for doing this. Um, I can. just, uh, I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about what our children are doing on the other side. And I have to say you're one of the first um, mediums that I've actually heard say that. 
um, when we get there, then we're able to do those things with our kids that we're missing out on, like the marriage. Yeah. Cool I, I, when I, so cool. That makes me very, I, yeah, I got the, actually, I got that from uh, Carla, a little girl that taught me about exit points. Um, um, she explained it visually and stuff like that. And she explained to me that when you guys cross over, you'll be able to live that timeline all the way through. And she told the mom, even the terrible teens, said, hey, you're going to have to deal with it. You want it, you get the whole package, right? Um, and the first part of your question was on, I'm sorry, what was it on? Uh, just a little bit more of what they're doing on the other side. Oh, yeah, what they're doing. Yeah, I thought it was very fascinating that, um, you know, it's like a lot of things we read about. They're over there, they're learning. They're learning uh, different aspects of uh, being human if they're going to come here or if they're going to work with us. A lot of them work with people that are uh, newly arriving um, to help them understand their own crossing. Like we had just talked about suicide. So you might have some other children cross through suicide, help those um, that initially come over. A lot of them will work on our plane um, for various, through for healing, for insight, for creativity, open your mind and ask for help. When I deal, when I wrote this book, I, I bring a whole team together and the team has writers, English majors, and they introduce themselves. Um, you know, I had a girl that was like 21 or 22. She passed in college and she was an English major. So she wanted to help me write the book. So she, I, she was invited in. And um, so they like to work on different projects. And if you open up, and ask for help and guidance in any type of work you have, there are people on the other side that would love to help you because it creates that loving bond from their plane to our plane. And that's really exciting for them. And they love to see us being happy. And, and, and if they can help, they can. Okay, so, but one of the other things I wanna mention because, which I didn't realize, they like to watch, this one particular girl said, oh, I love to watch people, um, work on their craft, what kind of craft? She goes, oh, anything. She goes, people learn their musicians. They learn how to play certain instruments and they practice it before they come here. She goes, some people are engineers and they practice like architecture and building things. So when they come here, they have an aptitude for it. And I thought that was fascinating because, you know, a lot of times we know people, you know, when they're young children and stuff, they just have an aptitude for certain things. And it's like, where'd they learn that? You know, and now we know that they learned it on the other side. They were fine tuning it. So they brought it with them to the earth plane. Sometimes it will open up and that's what they'll do in their lives. Or it'll be one of the things they do in their lives. And sometimes it'll remain dormant because other things, experiences that happen into their life through free will might not allow it to come out. Okay. Um, but that's all through, through free will. But that's a lot of times why we see these people that just have a, just a knack for things because, uh, so she says, yeah, I watched these people develop their skills on the other side. She goes, oh, it's fast, fascinating. So that's one of the things they do, which is really cool. Thank you so much. This book has covered so many different topics and it goes, obviously goes into more depth than some of the stuff I talked about. And I think it's the type of book that will be good for uh, uh, research and also the type of book that you will reread multiple times in different sections and you will get things out of it. They wanted it written also for people um, who lose children in the future. So they, you know, uh, some people might be more advanced and, and lost children over a decade ago or 20 years ago, whatever, and how they can help uh, newly bereaved parents um, go through their skills. And also one of the main things at the beginning of the book also, originally it was called for those uh, parents who had lost children. And it was changed because I was told that many people are um, mentors and many people are uh, coaches and, and neighbors and family members that uh, help uh, bring up a child and have a loving bonding relationship with that child. And when the child passes, they're afraid to show their uh, grief because they feel like they will be, um, you know, that they weren't a family member in that they do not have a right to grieve as much as a biological parent. And I think that's very important for all of us to understand our perspective that um, 
people, other people in our children's lives, um, when a child pass, they we really need to respect their their grief because we're all connected on different levels, but we are all connected, especially um, especially young children. But Joe, how can we best communicate with them if they love being around us and they're watching us? Well, I think the main thing is, you know, we talk about meditation and um, being in a meditative state. Um, it, it it goes a long way. And, and I know people that say, oh, I can't meditate. But it, meditation is kind of like a broad word. I love to use the, the term active meditation. And what happens when you do active meditation, which is basically anything from painting, drawing, working in the garden, doing a sport, anything that takes your mind away from your everyday activities. So you're focused on something. It could be cooking. And, and you get into like, you know, what they say, the zone. You know, I remember going into my kitchen when my mom was cooking and she had a thousand pans everywhere. And you could tell she was in another world because she was just creating something. So I call that active meditation. Those are great times for the kids to come through and give us a sign uh, because, um, you know, it, it, it might be something out of the ordinary that in the middle of our focus, it'll grab our attention because it wasn't supposed to be there. Okay. So I, I, I want people to participate in, in an active meditation or regular full meditation um, because it lowers our, um, our brain activity trying to overwork everything. You know what I mean? Um, we have a, a tendency to overanalyze things and, and do things and um, our stress levels goes up, which blocks things. The children, some of their insights talk about uh, anger or being upset. And it, it's, it, it brings like a, a gray cloud or thickness. For the, it's hard for them to penetrate that as opposed to when they are laughing and, and you are more happy, then it's easier for them to come through. Okay. So um, the more you can do with that, obviously, that will help them to come through. Ask them before you go to sleep that you'd like a message and don't put you know any attachments to it and they'll try to come through in a dream visitation. Okay. If you do get a sign, just say thank you. I'm glad you came through. It's wonderful, and I love you. And keep them coming. You know what I mean. And uh, uh, they'll try to do that also. Joe, what happens when there's a child that's born stillborn, and uh, the parents never see the baby or never name it or him or her? Um, and since there's no time apparently in the afterlife. Um, if it happened so many years ago, uh, there wouldn't necessarily be, uh, what, 40 or 50 now. So how does that go? If we, we will contact that person, um, what do we do? We don't know a name or anything. Well, uh, first of all, when you get to the other side, if, if that particular baby had a soul um, with it, um, it, when you reconnect on the other side, by their energy, you'll know who it is. Absolutely, you'll know by their by, by their essence, their energy. Um, many times, when a child is born, the soul does not come into the child right away. Um, we see instances of miscarriages, abortions, um, you know, uh, health conditions, or things like that. That a child may come um, and only live for a very very short time. For a particular purpose, other times a child might decide, change his mind, basically, and say, "No, I, I don't want to incarnate at this time," and the pregnancy will end. Um, and other times, it, it the child could be born, and, and for that reason, like I just said, the, the the soul won't be there because the child decided not to incarnate. Don't, like I said earlier, remember the child's deciding if they're going to come here, and they're the leader. And the parents and, and, and the rest of us, we don't get a say in it. And we do not get a say in their transition. That's their gig, okay? Even if, it, even if it's um, an accident, uh, not a pre-planned accident, through free will, it's still their choice because it was free will. Like if they decided to go hang gliding and they don't know how, how to go to hang, how to hang glide and they die off the side of the mountain, that's free will, that, that was their choice. Uh, if they pass in an accident or through an illness that was pre-planned, that's all always part of their choice. But the main thing is they come in here, it's their choice. They might coordinate with the parents about when, 
but that's about it. So, um, so they decide. So at the very, very conception and birth, um, they decide. Um, yeah, I've been reading your book over the weekend. I'm not quite finished. I agree with what you say about it's one of those books that you pick up again and again. Um, my question was about parents suiciding to be with their children. Could that not ever be part of a soul plan between two plans? No, Can no, it's actually, no, no. If a parent commits suicide to be with that child, um, they corrupt the um, the balance, and so they have to go through much uh, much healing and and um, understanding when they get to the other side. And like I said, at that point, they'll see the child, but the child's going to be. Um, it might not be that child of that particular age and personality um, because what happens is it's thrown off the soul plans and life plans of other people left behind and um, in, in the parent might not know that that suicide um, was caused by bigger problems like, like we had just talked about through not being able to um, deal with certain situations and things like that, but it, it just makes a problem. It just it makes a huge problem if they do, and what they expect is not what they get. They're surrounded by love and they're surrounded by uh, compassion and healing and teaching, but they, it's not the way they expect to be able to see their child like they were here right. before they left. Thanks, but Jay. If they, if they do it naturally, they're going to be able to relive that life if they want, if they choose. Hello, Joe. So Hi. my question is pretty general. It's um, my daughter actually had this question the other day. What about the children that are like born in third world countries? You know, and they live for like a month because they're starved or there's illness and then they pass. Was there some big purpose for that? Because, you know, most of those parents have children because they want to, you know, keep like keep the family going and I was just wondering you know they come and then they leave so soon like what would be their main purpose well individually that they might have uh, they have individual purposes depending on each situation all right so that that early passing might affect a brother or a sister or someone in that village um, so that could play out another thing that I want to mention and it's a it's a nice question that you brought up is you know, we travel, we do soul groups and, and situational living between souls and stuff, but it also goes on to um, uh, nation levels, uh, large group levels. Um, I, there's a chapter on, um, on murder and violence in the book, and I had to ask my guides about um, people, children that died by genocide and things like that on a large scale. And uh, on that particular situation, um, uh, groups uh, decide to leave, come and leave, experience certain experiences and leave together. And I think, um, you, and you see that with uh, natural disasters like tsunamis or hurricanes and things like that. Um, so that's, that's on a higher scale, how, higher scale of interaction than the individual interactions we might see between family members and friends in our daily lives. But they happen, they can happen on a larger scale too. And I think that's what you would see in some of these uh, some of these areas of the world where they have a high mortality rate for children. Yeah, yeah. So, hi, Joe. So uh, a couple nights ago, in the middle of the night, well, it was about quarter to 12, I actually woke up. The air conditioner had shut itself off. And I sat there and I'm like, oh, my goodness, it's going to be so hot in here. And I just was not really moving, just thinking, oh, well, it must have died, you know. So... After a while, I, I thought, hmm, maybe, perhaps I should turn the sound machine on so I can sleep. You know, it's next to my husband's side of the bed on the nightstand. And within moments, the sound machine turned itself on. And I, I couldn't help but think it was my son who had also transitioned by suicide. Yeah. That he was reading my thoughts. And, and he manipulated his energy to turn it on so I didn't have to get up. Yeah, I mean, that's a great sign. It really is. And, and reading, you say reading the thoughts. They will sometimes, but a lot of times they'll put the thought in our, our own head. 
we think it's our thought, but they're the one that threw it in there. Oh. Yeah, right. So sometimes, you, you know, when you get a sign, you'll be thinking about a loved one, and then the sign will pop up. Sometimes it's us, but a lot of times it's them. Like, they get the sign ready, but they got to get your attention. So they'll throw that in your mind like, oh, I'll tell mom that uh, to think about me. And then mm -hmm. I'll show her the sign and she'll make the connection. They're very clever. And, and the kids get a real hoot out of it. They love it. They laugh about it. They giggle about it. They really go to, uh, <laughs> they, they, they do, they, I don't know, man. They just have a better way about doing it than adults. I think it's because their energy is so strong and they're still, you know, the, 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 the younger you pass, the easier it is for them to transition because they, it hasn't been a long time since they've been on the other side. And, um, oh, by the way, when a child passes, no matter what way, violence or anything, their transition is automatic. It's the same. Um, it's, it's built into our system. Um, uh, children aren't lost. They're never lost. Um, it's, they, they know the process. It's a very easy process, and they know the process to, to, be, to get to the point to be greeted by loved ones. So I wanted to throw that in. But that sounds like a great sign. And it's not unusual. I've heard other ones like that with Alexa going off, you know, in the mm -hmm. middle of the night. And, and so right. they, they're great with electronics. He's always been quite active and turned on, like, battery-operated candles that the batteries hadn't worked in years. Um, like the night before my mom passed, that light came on. And I knew it. Um, he's come through orbs. He's in a dream visitation, too. So yeah, I, I feel that's blessed. wonderful. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I added a lot of science stories. There's over 40 in the book. So people can realize, you know, you just can't make some of this stuff up. It's, it's wild, you know. And Karen's got a couple of great ones in the book. And uh, I, I love people reading them because it brings healing to each other. You guys are sharing them. And, um, and they're just they're fantastic. That It just reinforces that we know they're still around us. They're still part of our lives and we can still interact with them.